Hello everyone and welcome to Crosswalk. My name is Steven, I'm the worship director here. Thank you so much for being with us today on this Memorial Day weekend as we conclude our message series, The Ultimate Comeback. Today, Pastor Chris is gonna have a message for us called From Alone to Community. And in it, he's gonna address some of the things that are going on in our lives relationally. And he's gonna show us how God is gonna walk with us through this. But before we get to that message, I want to spend some time in worship, joining our hearts and our voices, praising our everlasting God. God never intended for us to be alone. From creation, he addressed this issue by creating Adam and Eve. But in this time, it is so easy to be alone, to feel isolated. One thing that I personally have been struggling with a lot lately is pushing others away, including God. Now when we get into that place where we're 
pushing those around us, pushing God out of our lives, we fall into sin and can feel even more isolated. But God promises, no matter how you feel, how far you feel you are from him, that he will hear your prayers. So let's take some time this morning to come before God in prayer and confess our sins to him. Let's pray. Lord God, we come before you today to confess that we're sinful. Lord, we have pushed others away. We've pushed you away. And based on our own actions, our own sins, We only deserve your punishment. But Lord, I ask, have mercy on us. Forgive us for the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. Now we have an opportunity to join our voices in prayer with the words of the Lord's Prayer. So if you feel comfortable, please join with me as the words of the Lord's Prayer are shown on your screen. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. You are not alone. God promised in the Bible to always be with his people. And that promise still stands today because God is faithful. He is loving and he is gracious. And no one shows God's grace better than Jesus Christ who came down from heaven and lived a perfect life and then went to the cross to go through total isolation so that you never have to. In that act, He took on your sin. He took on your shame. He took on your punishment. And because of his sacrifice for you, all of your sins are forgiven. You are a dearly loved child of God. That is grace. Now let's lift up our voices in praising him for that grace that he has given us. restless 
peace bring it all to peace the storm surrounding me let it break at your name still call the sea to still the rage in me to still every wave at your name Jesus Jesus you make the darkness tremble Jesus Jesus you silence fear Jesus Jesus you make the darkness tremble Jesus Jesus breathe call these bones to live call these lungs to sing once again I will praise Jesus Jesus you make the darkness tremble Jesus Jesus you silence fear Jesus Jesus you make the darkness tremble Jesus 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 you make the darkness tremble Jesus Jesus you silence fear Jesus Jesus you make the darkness tremble Jesus Happy Memorial Day, Crosswalk. It is so good to see all of you and certainly pray that you are getting blessed with some time with family and friends and maybe some rest and relaxation. Welcome to our guests as well. We are so privileged and honored to have you be able to tune in this morning as well. And uh, just a few things uh, before we get into the message that I would like to get a chance to talk to you about. One of the things is just to, so that you are able to stay tuned into what is happening at Crosswalk. We just invite you to be following our news section on our website at cwlk.church. 
and uh, you are able to just see all the different um, announcements that we have that are, are coming up and be able to see some of the different outreach events that we are going to be having coming up as well. So check that out at cwlk.church. Also, we want to pray for you. And we want to pray for the people that are on your heart and mind as well. And so we invite you to make use of the email that we have at prayer at cwlk.church. And we would love for you to be able to share what's on your heart and mind. And we pray over those things each and every week. And uh, also we're able to plug you into certain things if you have questions about that as well. And then just the, the third thing that I really wanted to share with you is that um, we have, coming up in June, we're launching our summer series of growth groups. And as I'm going to be talking about in the message in just a moment, we're going to just share with you that it is such a good thing to be a part of that. We're going to be showing a video during the message that really just explains and, and shows just how fun and how supportive and encouraging and loving our growth groups really are. It, as you'll hear, it's like family. And if you are not in a group or if you are in a group, we invite you to go ahead and invite a friend into your group so that we're able to just be together and to enjoy that good Christian fellowship and time in God's word. You can find that information on our website at cwlk.church as well as on the Church Center app. We'd encourage you that if you don't have that app to go ahead and download it and uh, you are able to find a different events, different groups, and different information on there as well. And finally, we are a member-supported church. And so it is our privilege to be able to work together to share the gospel. And one of the ways that we do that is to be able to fund the events and the ministries that we have. And so, again, just for our members, as well as any guests that are our regular attenders, we invite you to support that. And you can check that out on, if you're on our online platform, you'll see that on a mobile device, there's the menu there that has the communication card that we encourage you to fill out, as well as the giving card that you push on that button, and that'll take you to the giving part of our app. And this, again, is just something that we encourage our members and, and if you're a regular attender to be a part of. We don't expect our guests, we don't want your money. And so we don't expect you to do that. You certainly can if you wish. But it's just our way of saying thank you to God for all that he has given to us. All right, I think that's about it for our announcements. And now just to like to share with you a little bit about our message. It's Memorial Day, and you know, on Memorial Day weekend, it is a great time to be able to get together and enjoy time with family and friends. But I will tell you that there is a, a time right now where some of you are maybe alone this weekend for the very first time. This is your first Memorial Day after you had a loved one who passed away this past year, and you're lonely. And what's so interesting about this is that just recently a Time Magazine article came out about loneliness and in it many experts agreed that this pandemic from COVID-19 has made Americans lonelier than ever before. I'm going to push back on that thought just a little bit. I'm not going to argue with the experts but to a certain extent I believe that this uh, pandemic is not what has caused loneliness. It has revealed that we are lonely. And I believe that there are really two big reasons why Americans struggle with loneliness. And this really leads us to the very first um, section that we want to take a look at. To get a clear picture of what loneliness really is, take a look at these three statements that are coming up on the screen. And I'm just going to have you react to them on our chat lines. You can either agree or disagree with these three statements. And let's take a look at the first one. It says, people can feel alone even when they are around others. Do you agree or disagree with that statement? You can go ahead and drop that into the chat line. Here's the number two. The cure for loneliness is having people you can talk to. And then number three, even though I may feel lonely, I am never truly alone. You know, that third one is really where I want to start today because it's true regardless of how we feel. Because the reality is God tells us and he promises us, never will I leave you, never will I forsake you. 
Now, I find great comfort in that, even though there are times in my life where I definitely feel lonelier than others. In fact, just recently, I took a loneliness questionnaire online just to kind of see where I would fall. And you want to know what? It actually did categorize me as someone who feels lonely many times. Probably in part for that is because I am an extreme extrovert and it's killing me to, to be under these social distancing guidelines that I just don't get to go to Starbucks and hang out with people all the time. Certainly thankful that some of those restrictions are lifting. But the fact is, is that we have, in the midst of this pandemic, there is now a realization that all along we have had a loneliness epidemic in our American culture. There are two big reasons for that. The first is our first fill-in. We don't want to be judged by people who don't understand us. Think about that. You know, this would probably be the reason why back in high school, when I would go to a high school dance, I was one of the guys who would be along the wall. And not because I'm, I'm shy, I'm not shy at all. But the fact is, is that you know, there's just this fear of what other people think. Am I gonna make a fool of myself? And you know what, I got over that. Eventually I was the guy making a fool of myself out there on the dance floor. Just ask my wife when we were dancing together at our, our wedding. But the fact is, is that there's just this certain fear that we're worried about what other people think of us. We're worried about being judged by people who don't understand us. By the way, this isn't just a high school thing either. This happens to us in our workplace. It happens to us in our neighborhoods. It might even be one of the reasons why some of you who are watching today, that you have never stepped foot in a church because you have heard about Christians. You've heard and maybe even experienced some of the criticism of what you wear or how you talk. Maybe you've even been the victim of a Christian who has judged you without care and without love for the lifestyle that you've been leading. And you know what? If I had people like that in my life, I don't think I'd want to hang around them either. But I want you to understand that not all Christians are that way. In fact, most Christians are not that way. And the fact is, is that sometimes we have used that as a way of just saying, you know what, I don't want to be a part of that. I don't want to be judged by people who don't understand us. And so we'd prefer to be alone instead of to be judged. That's really one of the, the big reasons for loneliness that's happening in our American culture, the fear of what people think. But another reason, and this is our, our second fill-in, another reason is that as a society, we have a low pain tolerance when it comes to relationships. You know, I am so blessed by God. I'm blessed with amazing family, amazing friends. I am blessed with a great marriage and four wonderful kids. I'm blessed with being a part of a church fa family here at Crosswalk that I am just blown away by the generosity and love and care that our members at Crosswalk show all the time. But the thing is, relationships get painful. Relationships are messy because we're messy and we're sinful people. There are gonna be times where unintentionally, I'm gonna say something or I'm gonna do something that's gonna hurt you and vice versa. And that's the thing is that relationships are painful because we are sinful. But the fact is, is that we need to understand that when it comes to our relationships, that they, most of them are worth the effort to fight through the pain, to be able to grow and, and to be able to grow closer as we go through those changes within our relationships. But you know, as you take a look at the graph that's coming up on the screen here, this loneliness epidemic hits all generations, but the generation that it hits the hardest is Generation Z. When you look at this graph, you'll see that three out of every four that fall into that age group would classify themselves as lonely. Even though I personally know a bunch of people in that age group and they are more connected online with social media and are always on their phones and, and talking with friends, they're more connected than ever and yet there is still a disconnect in their mind. And I'm convinced that one of the big reasons for that is because 
when it comes to our relationships, we have a relatively low pain tolerance. So that when friendships get hard, and they do, things are said and done that hurt one another, a lot of times, you know what, I'm just going to unfriend this person. Or I'm just going to stop talking to them. And maybe that's you. Maybe you have personally experienced that. And so when you burn by people, then you just naturally ask the question, well, is it worth the effort to try to rebuild this bridge? Or is it worth the effort to even engage with someone else? Do you see why that too is a big reason for the loneliness epidemic that we have in our American culture? Do you also realize that God loves us so much, he wants us in relationships? First and foremost, a relationship with him, but also a relationship with others, because here's the truth. God doesn't want us to be burned by people, but he also doesn't want us to be alone. In fact, when we go all the way back to the beginning of time, when we look at Genesis chapter 2, God had just created Adam, but he had not created Eve yet. This is what he had to say in Genesis 2, verse 18. He said, it is not good for the man to be alone. From the lips of our creator, we hear that he says, we need each other as people. We need to be together. In fact, he actually says we are good for each other. And so the natural question that we need to ask ourselves is, okay, so what's it going to take then to overcome loneliness? What does it take to overcome the fear of being connected to a group of people who maybe doesn't get me? What does it take to be able to experience a comeback from being alone to being in community? Well, in order to answer that, I invite you to open up your Bible or your Bible app. By the way, if you have the YouVersion Bible app, you can find our notes for this message in the events section, the live events section of that app. And I invite you to open up your Bibles to Acts chapter 1. And we're going to be looking at verses 12 through 14, but then we're going to be skipping to Acts chapter 2 and, and looking at verses 42 through 47 as well. But in these opening verses in Acts chapter 1, the, the gospel writer Luke, and he wrote the, the gospel of, of Luke all about Jesus' life. And then the book of Acts really is Luke's sequel to what he wrote in the gospel of Luke. And Luke here just gives us a little bit of a recap of what was occurring in those 40 days between Jesus' resurrection and when he ascended back into heaven. And during those 40 days, he was appearing to his disciples. And, and as Acts 1 verse 3 says, he was giving many convincing proofs that he was alive. He just wanted to make them absolutely certain that this was no joke, that he was really alive, that sins were really forgiven, that death was really defeated. And so he would show them his hands, his feet. Uh, Luke records for us that he actually sat down and ate with them. And the Apostle Paul actually tells us in 1 Corinthians 15 that Jesus actually appeared to over 500 believers at one time. And all of them became eyewitnesses of the reality of Jesus' resurrection. But on that 40th day after Jesus had risen from the dead and he had made all of these appearances to his disciples, he then ascended back into heaven. And, and Luke tells us in these opening verses in Acts that the disciples were watching intently as, as Jesus went into heaven and then a cloud covered him and, it, and they were still there just kind of looking intently at, at where Jesus was when all of a sudden two angels appeared to them and said, hey, why, why are you looking into the sky? This Jesus is going to come back the same way he left you. As if to say, be about your mission. But I want you just to think about, put yourself into the shoes of the disciples for just a moment. For the last three years, they had seen Jesus on a daily basis. They hung out with him. They ate meals with him. They watched him do things that no one had ever done before. Healing the sick. Raising the dead. They had heard his soul-stirring teachings. And over the course of three years, they had built this amazing 
friendship. He was more than their Lord. He was more than their Savior. He was their friend. And now, just like that, he was gone. Just put yourself into their shoes for a moment. They had to have this profound sense of sadness and loneliness. And so what do you do when you have to say goodbye to somebody that's a dear friend that you've been together with for a long time? What do you do when you are facing a new normal that you don't like? And for some of you on Memorial Day, as you remember your loved ones who have died this past year, this is hard, isn't it? And what do you do when you struggle with those feelings of loneliness? Well, we want to do what the disciples did. They stuck together. And so let's take a look at Acts chapter 1, and let's start with verse 12. Then the apostles returned to Jerusalem from the hill called the Mount of Olives, a Sabbath day's walk from the city. When they arrived, they went upstairs to the room where they were staying. Those present were Peter, John, James, and Andrew, Philip and Thomas, Bartholomew and Matthew, James, son of Alphaeus, and Simon the Zealot, and Judas, son of James. They all joined together constantly in prayer, along with the women and Mary, the mother of Jesus, and with his brothers. Now, we want to look at these verses really with two questions in mind. When it comes to being a part of a group, when it comes to sticking together, the first question comes pretty naturally to us, and that is, what's in it for me? But the second question is the one that we also want to keep in mind whenever we're thinking about being a part of a group or being a part of a church. And that is, what's in it for the community that I'm joining? Now, the first question comes pretty naturally to us because, well, I mean, to a certain extent, wouldn't you agree, we want to budget our time and energy wisely. And so we're going to naturally ask the question, what's in it for me? Because we want to make sure that this group that we're spending time with and that we're putting effort into is going to be good for us. And that's a natural question for all of us to want to ask. But let's be honest. There is also sometimes a very selfish bent to that question. That we are going to be a part of a group because we're looking to get something out of those people. We're looking to get something out of them. And, and so what happens is that if we join a group because of that reason, because we want to be selfishly filled and not also be willing to fill others and, and care for others, then no group is ever going to be good enough for us. And that's why that second question is so important of what's in it for the community that we get to be a part of. Because that helps us be able to put down that sinful side of us. I mean, my sinful nature and your sinful nature, what we were born with, is like an internal toddler. It's all about me. It's always asking the question, what's in it for me? And in order to combat that, we want to be thinking about that other question of what's in it for others when I join this group. Because here's the thing. The cure for loneliness is not selfishness. No, the cure for loneliness is selfless community. And that's what Jesus teaches us here. Now, let's look back at, at verse 14 again for just a moment. It says, They all joined together constantly in prayer, along with the women and Mary, the mother of Jesus, and with his brothers. Now, sometimes, and I'm guilty of this, that sometimes we have the tendency to ju jump right to the what of a passage like this here, instead of also looking at the who, uh, who's involved here. A and yes, they join together constantly in prayer, and that is something that is great value in being in a Christian community, that we get to pray together, we get to pray for each other and pray with each other. And I love that. Yesterday, we celebrated um, a one-year anniversary of when a dear friend of mine, a, a, a principal at St. Mark Lutheran School, when he was called home to Jesus one year ago yesterday. And the fact is, is that, you know what, that was an incredibly devastating day. And I can't imagine trying to get through something like that without Christian community 
and time spent in prayer with each other. And that's exactly why these disciples were doing what they were doing. They prayed together constantly because they also experienced a loss. Jesus was now in heaven and no longer with them. They knew he was alive, but they missed him. But here's the thing. I want to focus on the who for just a moment here. Notice that Luke records for us here that, yeah, there were the 11 disciples out of the 12 original ones, minus Judas the betrayer. But then we also see that he records for us that the women who were there, and many of them were the ones who got to see Jesus first on that Easter morning and then tell the disciples that Jesus was alive. But then Luke tells us that Mary, the mother of Jesus, was there and his brothers. Now, there are some commentaries that will say that, you know, that may also just be the, the typical Christian term for a fellow believer that, you know, a lot of times we call each other brothers and sisters. And you know what? That may very well be. But I tend to think that because it's in the same line as Mary, the mother of Jesus, and his brothers, it may very well be referring to Jesus' half-brothers, probably the most famous of which is James, who became an apostle. James, the one who wrote the book of James in the Bible. But we need to understand that originally when Jesus was first making these claims of being the Messiah and being the Son of God and the Savior, they all thought he was nuts. And so here's our next fill-in. What's in it for me to be a part of a Christian community? I can find a place of grace where I can be honest about my struggles. Because here's the thing that I want us to think about. If indeed these were Jesus' half-brothers who were there, that means that they came around. That means that even though they had all these questions about Jesus, even though they were skeptical, and even though they were not believing in him at all, once Jesus rose again from the dead, that changed everything. And the fact is, is that at this point now, they were, they were wanting to be a part of this group of followers of Jesus. And you know what? This group of followers of Jesus welcomed them with open arms. Regardless of their past, regardless of their questions, they found a place of grace. Now, I can't help but think of what our resilient ministry is like here at Crosswalk, where, again, we have people who are coming in with all kinds of questions, who are coming in with checkered past, who are coming in with a present that's all messed up because of their past, who are coming in with guilt and shame and all of these regrets, and they find a place of grace. Grace is God's undeserved and unconditional love. And we have people from all walks of life coming in. They're struggling with addictions or broken relationships or whatever it may be. And within this resilient ministry, they have a place where they can be honest about their struggles, a place where they can confess their sins, where they can receive the assurance that they're forgiven through the blood of Jesus and they are empowered to live new. Hey, if you are in that place in your life right now where you want a do-over, come here to Crosswalk. You'll find a place of grace. But also understand that there are some mental hang-ups that we have to overcome. That there are some mental roadblocks when it comes to, again, being a part of a group of people that we may not know very well. And again, one of those hangups, as I talked about before, is the fact that we just have this fear of what people think. If I share the real me, if I share what I'm really, on, really honestly struggling with, what are people going to think of me? And that is a very real fear that, that many of us have. I even struggle with that as well. And the thing is, is that we don't want people to see our struggles. And part of that is because of the culture in which we live. Wouldn't you agree? We are in a performance-based culture. That we find our identity and we find our worth based on how good we perform in our work world or in our relationships. But the problem is, is that you are never going to find that you are enough. 
You are never going to find satisfaction if that's how you measure your worth and your identity. No, Jesus says, listen, your identity is not based on what you achieve. It's based on what you receive by faith in me. That's what Jesus says. And what we receive by faith in him is a new identity that we are deeply and dearly beloved children who are forgiven of our past and empowered for our present and are confident in our future. That's what Jesus promises us. An identity not on what we achieve, but on what we have received from him. So if you're tired, if you're worn out by the stress to impress, then join a group. Be a part of a Christian community where you can find a place of grace and be honest about your struggles and receive the forgiveness and the power to live a new life through Jesus. Now, let's dive into Acts chapter 2. So Acts chapter 2 gives us a little bit of what happened next. So 10 days after Jesus had ascended into heaven, Pentecost happened. And on that day, as Jesus had promised, the Holy Spirit was poured out onto the disciples. And, and what an exciting day it was. I mean, Peter, uh, you know, he was, he was always this guy who would usually speak and then think. And, you know, he just kind of had this way about, he was a fearless leader, but he was very fearful when Jesus died. And even during those 40 days afterwards, that none of the disciples really came out of that room. They didn't really come out of their shell and, and go and be the bold witnesses that Jesus wanted them to be. It wasn't until that day, on that Pentecost day, when the Holy Spirit lit Peter on fire and he got up in front of thousands of people and preached about the reality of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And Luke tells us that over 3,000 people came to faith in Jesus on that day. What an awesome day it was. But what happened next? Well, this is where we dig into verses 42 through 47 of Acts chapter 2. It says, They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship, to the breaking of bread and to prayer. Everyone was filled with awe at the many wonders and signs performed by the apostles. All the believers were together and had everything in common. They sold property and possessions to give to anyone who had need. Every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes and ate together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. And the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. Here's our next fill-in. And this is the second part of that question, the series of questions that we want to think through. What's in it for our Christian community when I'm a part of it? Well, the answer is together, we get to live out the five purposes of the church. Those five purposes, the first one is discipleship. Number two is fellowship. The third purpose is worship. The fourth is outreach. And the fifth is service. Now I'm just going to take a real quick uh, glance at each of these five purposes of the church as we extract them from these verses. Because it's based on what they did in these verses. I mean, you look at verse 42 again and it said, they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching. That is what discipleship is all about. It's about relationship, focusing on the truth of what Jesus has taught us in his word. And it's a relationship in which we want to learn and we want to spend time in the Bible, not only personally, but together with others. We do so in our worship services. And honestly, one of the best ways to do that is to be in one of our growth groups. And the thing is, is that it's not just about learning God's word. It's about living it out in our lives and holding each other accountable to do that. It's all about relationship. But notice that it, they, it also tells us here that they devoted themselves to prayer. The fact is, is that prayer is a huge part of what we get to do as believers. That is part of that two-way street of communication. God speaks to us through his word. And we get to speak to God through prayer 
anytime, anywhere with whatever's on our heart and mind. And these disciples devoted themselves to doing that, which is all part of discipleship as we grow closer to each other and ultimately to God. But then the second one is, is fellowship, the second purpose. And, and notice that a fellowship really is all about sharing. They shared in a common faith. They shared in a common bond. They shared in their um, generosity. They shared in their care for one another. They, they celebrated the joyful things and they were there to help each other when they were burdened by things as well. And that's really what our growth groups are all about, all about doing life together. We have a video about one of our growth groups and what they did for one of our Crosswalk members by the name of Mary. And I'd like you to, sh uh, I'd like you to see this short clip right now. Take a look. Oh my gosh, I was so surprised. I, I never even dreamed of such a thing. Tanya's out there and I'm like, oh, she brought me a balloon and that wasn't that sweet. And then she goes, turn around and I'm going, oh my goodness, what is going on here? And then uh, dozens of people kept coming here. About a dozen people came driving by. It was pretty fun. I was felt pretty special. <laughs> and you have prayer support and life support, really. Because I've had, I was sick for a while, and when I was sick, people from my group came and helped me, and bought me bought groceries, took my aunt to the doctor, brought me things to keep me going. Uh, it's helped me find friendship a lot, because you really get to know somebody when you see them every week, and they share a little bit more and a little bit more. And as time goes on, you can't just open up the first time you come unless you want to. We had to spend time together and really just talk about what's going on in our lives. And that's kind of our motto, is doing life together. Isn't that just awesome? I mean, Mary was just blown away by the generosity and just the thoughtfulness of her growth group. Uh, putting together a parade to be able to celebrate her birthday. It's just, and she really, again, just said it so well that we're like family and that it's all about doing life together. And that's what fellowship, that's what that purpose, that's what our growth groups are all about. But notice the third purpose then is worship. And I love the fact that in this we see that uh, in verse 47 in particular, it says that they were praising God. And even back up to verse 46, where every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts, they gathered in their homes, and all the while they were praising God. That is the why of worship. That is why we do what we do. That we get together, we sing God's praises, we pray together, all because we worship God because of who he is and what he's done for us. You know, the word worship comes from the old English word that means worth it. We worship God because he's worth it to us. He is worthy of our praise. That brings us then to the, the fourth purpose, and that is outreach. Notice that it tells us here in the end of verse 47, and the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. That's because they were living out their love for one another. They were living out their love for their community. And when we love on our community and we do like some of the things that you've heard us doing in these past uh, few months of, of blood drives and food bags for those who are in need at, at schools and so on, those are all ways that we're able to love on our community and really not that we need to earn the right to be able to talk about Jesus, but it certainly makes people curious about why we're doing what we're doing. And then we get to say, it's all because Jesus first loved us, Jesus first served us, and so on. Which brings us then to the fifth purpose, and that is of service. That's one of our values, that we get to lower ourselves to be servants here at Crosswalk. And uh, just a couple of weeks ago, I had the privilege, uh, my, my boys and I had the privilege of, of being a part of the, the work, our outreach work and service work at the St. Mary's Food Bank. And again, just so commendable for everyone that was involved as we, again, love on our community. And that gives us an opportunity to run counterculture. 
Remember, in a certain respect, our culture is in that what's in it for me mentality. And whenever we serve without looking for anything in return, that's a refreshing change. That leads people to ask the question, why are you acting the way that you are? And once again, we get to point to Jesus. We love because Jesus first loved us. We serve because Jesus first served us. Jesus is the one who 2,000 years ago was born into this world and then went to the cross. He was alone on the cross, suffering what you and I rightfully deserve for all of our selfish moments, for all of those moments of the what's in it for me, for all of those moments when we have selfishly pushed people away or we have selfishly brought people in to use them to our own sinful ends, Jesus is the one who faced the punishment of our sins alone on the cross so that you and I can be in community with him now and forever in heaven. With Jesus, there is always grace always forgiveness, always community, all because of his love for us. And so as we close out, I, I want you just to think about this final fill-in that we have. Because of Jesus, we are never alone. We are never without purpose and never without a place of grace. Do you struggle with loneliness? Find community in Jesus, our gracious Savior. It's all about him. Amen. All right, uh, in closing, just again, a, a reminder of the, the memory verse that we have from today's message in Acts 2, verse 42. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship, to the breaking of bread and to prayer. And so our, our final takeaway really is kind of twofold. One is, is that, hey, if you're not in a group, let us know that you would like to get plugged into one. And, and you can make use of that email at prayer at cwlk.church. We'd love to hear from you. Or you can go to the Church Center app. And there you also can find the different groups that are listed out for you. Some of them are meeting in person this summer. Some of them are still meeting virtually. And some of them are going to be both. And so you can just pick and choose which ones you would like to be a part of. Also, just a reminder to fill out that communication card if you have not already done so. And uh, you can let us know some of your prayer requests from there as well. All right, and now let's uh, close with the blessing. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with all of you. Amen.